As an amateur radio operator, have you thought about building a kit? Whether you're a new tech or a seasoned amateur extra, kits may be just the thing for you. Let's explore the topic. Welcome to Ask Dave, episode 39. I'm Dave Kassler, amateur radio call sign KE0OG, here with a new episode of Ask Dave. Today's topic is an introduction to the wide world of kits. A kit can be defined very simply as a set of all the parts needed to assemble something, along with instructions on how to do so. We've all assembled kits, whether it's a bicycle with <laughs> some assembly required to furnish your flat packs. Just look at my study. The bookshelf came as a flat pack and required assembly. The same with the white set of drawers, the desk itself, and the treadmill. In fact, the treadmill assembly was so complicated, I hired a neighborhood teenager to put it together for me. So why are kits popular? By doing the assembly yourself, you save money that would otherwise have been spent on factory assembly. Note a key assumption here. The kit provider does all the design work and collects all the parts. What's left for you is the assembly. In amateur radio, where the term kit usually implies something electronic, the initial draw of kits many years ago was that they were much less expensive than equivalent finished gear. The point was that the actual manufacturing is avoided. And this works if the steps to manufacture a product are essentially the same as the steps to build it as a kit, all from discrete components of reasonable size. The great heyday of kit building was back in the 1950s, 60s, 70s, and into the early 1980s, when companies like Heathkit and Allied provided sophisticated kits. I built my first ham station, a Heathkit HW16, from a kit. Nowadays, modern gear is too complex to provide as a kit. Electronics assembly technology has changed dramatically, moving away from discrete parts to large-scale integrated circuits and specially programmed logic arrays. Further, manufacturing costs have come way down with offshore manufacturing and robots. Circuit boards are no longer populated by hand. In this computer card, all of the components are assembled by machine, and the parts are so tiny that it would be impractical to assemble this by hand. And today, there's much more emphasis on software rather than discrete components. Note, however, that if you'd like to play with the software, Raspberry Pi and Arduino kits are available. Given that the change in manufacturing methods makes it impractical to provide kits to save manufacturing costs, what is available in kit form for radio amateurs? Small QRP or low power transceivers are popular, and simple receivers signal generators, station accessories, and so on are all readily available. Note that these are all pre-designed, then parts, kits, and instructions are created. Who creates these kits? Well, it can be most anybody, and the quality varies accordingly. Before purchasing a kit, see if there's a review on eham.net. Scrolling down the list on eham for QRP radios shows a wide variety of suppliers. MFJ has an entire line of small electronics kits bearing the Vectronics label. This is an example of a CW electronic keyer that they provide. Sometimes kits provide only key components. For example, this little keyer provides only the dinky little circuit board and the most important integrated circuit, and that's all. Sometimes the cabinet must be purchased separately and may not be pre-drilled, such as the cabinet for my 30-meter QRP radio. And sometimes power supplies must be obtained separately. I point out that some ham radio equipment items don't call themselves kits, but in fact, that's what they are. Notable are antennas. My HF9V antenna has myriad parts and must not only be assembled carefully, but also painstakingly tuned. 
and the HF9V requires user-supplied radials. A popular antenna these days, the high-gain AV640, which doesn't require radials, still comes in many, many parts, all of which have to be assembled, followed by careful tuning. Now, the complexity of kits ranges from dead simple, requiring soldering only a few parts, such as this regenerative receiver from MFJ, to complex, such as this advanced level transceiver advertised in QST. Sometimes kits are rated as for beginners, intermediate, and so on. Test equipment can be as simple as a multimeter, or could require a signal generator, an oscilloscope, and so on. But usually kits for hams try for a minimum of test equipment. Soldering is generally required. There are even learn to solder kits which you can Google for. Note that unsoldering is sometimes required, especially if you install the wrong part. I admit I'm not very good at unsoldering. <laughs> I note here that Elecraft offers solder-free kit versions of its popular radios. They can lower the price of their equipment by passing on to you the time and effort required for final assembly. I must spend a moment on the temperament required for successful kit building. Kits aren't for everyone. You need to be patient, careful, unhurried, and willing to troubleshoot. You need to take the time to check off each assembly step and pay extraordinary attention to detail. The joy is in the building, not necessarily in the money saved. Start small so as to build your skills and confidence before tackling something more complex. Usually hand tools will suffice. A screwdriver, pliers, wire cutter, wire stripper, and soldering iron get you started. You can supplement this with something to hold the circuit board in place. A nice item to have is a ceramic screwdriver for adjusting trimmer capacitors. I should point out that you may, and likely will, run into difficulties. Assembly manuals vary widely in quality. The gold standard is the Heathkit approach, which walked carefully through everything. However, sometimes manuals can be rather terse, such as this manual that simply says to install all the resistors. I've even found some manuals to omit critical steps. Kits can be hard to troubleshoot. I had to send this OHR100A 20 meter CWQRP rig back to the supplier with a plea to make it work. Sometimes no tech support is available at all. A single mistake can be hard to find, let alone multiple mistakes. And some once common parts such as variable capacitors, are getting rare and expensive. If you lose a part, it can be hard to replace. For some reason, hand-winding toroid coils is taken to be the bane of kit building, but I've learned that the simple solution to that is patience. And I do point out in passing that since components are marked in quite a variety of colors, color blindness can be an impediment, although Carefully marking every part can mitigate this. And note that after building the kit, adjustments of one sort or another must be done, such as tuning or setting up the offsets. It's very nice to have a mentor while building kits. In ham radio, we call these Elmers. It's nice to be able to take your frustrating, incorrigible mess over to the home of a patient, experienced ham with good test equipment to see what's really going on and how to fix it. Some ham radio clubs even offer kit building events where everyone assembles the same model kit. That way, everyone walks away happy. In general, here's what's entailed. First, out of the box, make sure you have all the components and get the right ones laid out. An example is this card to which I've taped a resistor. Its value is 6.2 kilo ohms, and the identifying color bands are blue, red, and red. It's resistor number 131 in the kit. The part itself is so small that I needed a magnifying glass to identify it. Make sure you have space to do everything. Have excellent lighting. 
I have a fluorescent light with a built-in magnifying glass. Make sure no one can mess things up, and that includes pets. I have a cat that loves to scatter things laid out on the desk. Do things in an orderly manner according to the manual and do them in the order the manual says to do them. And don't take shortcuts. Watch for solder bridges that can short out to other parts. Don't leave out any required jumpers. When using headers, don't lose the shorting shunts. Double check your work prior to applying power. Usually kits these days use low voltages. If high voltages are involved, follow prescribed safety precautions as touching high voltages can be fatal. It's best, if possible, to build a little and test a little. An excellent example of this approach is my 30 meter QRP transceiver, which was built in small testable sections. Note that toroid winding requires patience. Follow the instructions exactly. And be careful of safety, such as problems that can be created by shorts or applying battery voltage incorrectly. Also, beware of the soldering iron itself as it will burn your skin instantly. Wear eye protection so you don't splash solder in an eye. Some of the items you'll be dealing with include the circuit board and discrete components. And note here that component marking can be an issue. Some integrated circuits are sensitive to static electricity. They'll often come pushed into conductive black foam and you need to follow the instructions on how to ground yourself before and during handling the component. Very often, ICs are in sockets. Another thing you can do is watch YouTube videos about your particular kit. Something to be wary of is surface mount technology, or SMT, also called a surface mount device, or SMD. You should avoid these unless you know what you're really doing. This 80 meter PSK31 QRP transceiver has two SMTs, both of which were incredibly difficult to install. I won't do another SMT project unless the SMTs are pre-mounted, such as they are in this signal generator kit. Finally, note that your kit will likely involve some mechanical assembly, which should be done as carefully and thoroughly as everything else. So, is kit building for you? It can be intensely satisfying, or a bit frustrating, or both. Kit building today is done largely for the fun of it. QRP, or low power equipment, is solidly in the realm of kit building. Look around, lots of things are offered as kits. Perhaps you can persuade your club to do a group kit build. The ZZRX40 is designed specifically for that. Thanks so much for watching. Give me your comments. Also, share this video with your friends. YouTube will put up some end icons here in a moment. You can click on or touch the round one with my face on it to subscribe. There's a square one that takes you to the tip jar on my website. Another square one takes you to my website where you can pose an Ask Dave question. And finally, one takes you to the Ask Dave YouTube playlist. Until we next meet, happy kit building and 73.